West Ham United, they've had some wonderful players over the years, the likes of Bobby Moore and Jeff Hurst, Martin Peters, Trevor Brooking. But none of them would ever reach the heights in the league as the boys of 86. In a season when there was a ban on live football on television, something was stirring in the East End of London. The likes of Alan Devonshire, Mark Ward and Ray Stewart were starring as John Lyle's Hammers finished third in the top division. It could so easily have been a title as well as they produced their best ever challenge in the league. We have three of that team with us, affectionately known as the Boys of 86, to share the time of their lives, starting with a man who cost the club over half a million pounds in 1979, at that time a world record for a goalkeeper. Phil Parks was an FA Cup winner with West Ham in 1980 when they were a second division team. He was never present in this particular campaign and went on to play for 11 seasons for the club. He was voted by a West Ham members poll as their best keeper of all time. My next guest was also an ever-present this season, a signing from Fulham just a couple of years previously. Tony Gale was a central defender who played nearly 300 appearances in his 10 seasons at Upton Park. And on leaving East London, he won a premiership title with Blackburn Rovers. And finally, their leading goal scorer, one of the most colourful characters of this era. His first senior football club was St Mirren. And Frank McAvenny's great form in Scotland attracted attention from south of the border. The West Ham manager, John Lyle, signed him in 1985 and he formed a formidable partnership with a young English striker, Tony Cotty. Ah, Phil Parks, I think you finished 16th the season <coughs> before. So was there any hint of what was to come in this campaign? None whatsoever, because we, uh, we'd had a, a, a dreadful pre-season as well. And so we thought that <laughs> we were going to carry on the start of the season where basically we'd left off the season before. And we had a bad start of the season too, um, losing away at Birmingham and then the first home game, I think, uh, against Luton. So we had no idea. We thought we were just in for the same sort of relegation battle. Um, just exactly the same as it was the season before. Mm. Can you remember what the feeling was like at the start of the season, Tony? Because, you know, I mean, it was a pretty depressing time for football, wasn't it, in the sense of the, you know, the Heisel uh, uh, had happened, the UEFA ban, record low attendances, no TV covering live games. Well, we knew there was a ban on European football, so it was not worth going for European <coughs> football, Jeff, for the season before. <laughs> <So> <laughs> no, to, to be honest, it was a struggle. It was a struggle, but the difference was for the, the season coming up. We made three signings, and I'll always go back to it. We made, obviously, the uh, cab driver from Scotland, Frank <laughs> Magaveni, and we had uh, Mark Wald, who was uh, an outside right, or right winger, as you want to call it, and on the left, a return from injury from the great Alan Devonshire. So yeah. it was a very different side. I, OK, only three faces, but uh, mm. three really key players in, in a setup that really linked it all together. That was the difference. Mm. So, w what was the mood amongst the squad when they heard Frank McAvenny was coming? Were they really excited, <laughs> Phil? <laughs> we said, who the fucking hell is that? Because we'd never heard of him, to be honest. <laughs> and uh, when we first met him, <coughs> the, the thing was, we hadn't got a clue what he was saying. No one could understand him. He had this broad Glaswegian yeah. accent. And I mean, seriously, we needed a translator. Yeah. You know, they have problems with the foreign managers now, but I mean, Frank needed a translator himself. And uh, it quickly. You know, we, we warmed to him very, very quickly because he is—he was a great guy, a great character. Mm. Um, we found that out very quickly that you know he'd like to enjoy himself on and off the field, and uh, and so you know a, a star, if you like, was born <laughs> at West Ham, and he, he became part of us very, very quickly. T took a while for a, a national star to be born in a way, though, didn't it? Because of the lack of television coverage, you know, you were uh, almost a, a mythical sort of figure to most football fans oh, in yeah, England. yeah, in that respect it was great for me because after the game on a Saturday I could go out and do what I wanted <laughs> and uh, nobody knew what I looked like, so in that respect it was, it was uh, quite good. Mm. But in a football in sense it would have been great for everyone to see the goals that had been scoring and everyone else over the world, I think Denmark and Sweden were showing it uh, on the football, but we did get here. So you, you were unrecognisable for <coughs> the player that came from Scotland, weren't you? Because when we signed Don't him, start all this. Here we go. When we signed him straight Doris away, Jeff. Jeff I yeah. mean, we always joke about it, but yeah. we, as soon as we signed Frank McAvenny, like Phil said, who, who the bleeding hell is this? So uh, we've all gone looking in the, in the books, all the Scottish annuals, you know, the topical times yeah. and all that as it was at the day. And then we saw this ginger haired striker. Ginger? No, I'll tell, I'll tell you. Ginger haired striker. No, I'll tell it. Ginger haired striker <laughs> from Scotland. 
Yeah. Well, he turns up. He's blonde hair. He's yeah. got a cap teeth. He's yeah. got the lot. He's got carried away already. Oh, yeah. we, <laughs> when we got in the showers, we knew then that he really was ginger ale. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think was, uh, ITV were doing a profile on me, and all the boys were watching this, and they were showing you all the goals from St Mirren, and they were going. I remember Dev standing beside me going. Well, where are you? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's me. <laughs> so that was the start of it. Was, uh... was, was London one of the appealing factors in coming to West Ham? Then, no, I actually came down to sign for Luton Town. I actually went to sign. I was, you know, the contract was there for me to sign. But uh, fortunate for me, there was a. It wasn't Eric Morkham that was the chairman anymore. It was, it was some fat guy, and, and he gave me a slap and says, "Welcome to Luton." And, and I thought, "Who are you?" <laughs> so it was that close for me to sign for mm -hmm. for Luton. And then the manager says, West Ham, he, he, the traditions, you know, Bobby Moore and Jeff Hurst, as you say, Martin Peters, the three boys that won the Cup for England, so that was enough for me. Mm. Yeah, but the real reason, Frank, to be honest, you've got to admit, there's not a string fellas in Luton, is there? So. Well, actually, <laughs> when I came down, I came, down, I came, down, I came down for the Live Aid concert, I came down here with my mates and went to Live Aid concert, and, and actually... You know, Stringfellas gave me a knockback that night. I never got in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I went to Stringfellas and he said, no, you can't yeah. get in. I've never let him forget it since, but never mind. Yeah. It was good. It was good I mean, you, you mentioned some of the, the great names, Phil, you know, that West Ham have been associated with. But I think it, it, it's fair to say, you know, that the squad that went so close to winning the title in AD6, it wasn't littered with internationals, was it? No, not at all, no. I mean, you had a lot of players like, sort of like Stevie Walford and George Parrish who played, shared the left-back mm. position, and you had Neil Orr in, uh, in midfield. And uh, he shared the, the, with, with Jeff Pike, <coughs> so there wasn't that many. And Dick, I think of one, one of the key players in that side was Alan, Di uh, Alan Dickin. I thought he was a best which, player that, that season. Fantastic player, 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 but very underrated as well. Mm. And so yeah, we had a, we had a lot. I mean, Dev Dev coming back, I think, was a, a great boost to us because yeah. we'd missed him. And we, we I didn't I didn't play. I mean, the boys were telling me what it was like before he got before injured. And, and he I mean, was out for two years when he came back in. Yeah, I'd love to have played. You know, I, mm. for me, it was one of the best players I've what, ever what played. What was special about him? I just used to. If Dev could score goals, oh. it would have been world class. I mean, honestly, he used to beat three players round the goalkeeper and put it by the post. You know, what <laughs> <he was saying? laughs> he just got a rush of blood, didn't he, when he round yeah, the goalkeeper? But, yeah, but he was one of those players who could, you could give him the ball, Jeff, and yeah. even with his bad knee, he, you yeah. know, and it, it was he couldn't get a full extension on yeah. the knee when he came yeah. back. You know, obviously operations are a lot better now; they come back a lot better, but. You know, like he's our great friend, but mm -hmm. he was, in my opinion, he was world class. Yeah, he yeah. was oh, world class. Easily. I would put him you could there. give him yeah. a ball in any yeah. situation. He ran 50, yeah. 60 yards with the ball. Defenders would back off, and they were petrified of him. Mm -hmm. And he could go either way. He could kick with his right. Mm -hmm. Could kick with his left. He wasn't good from long range, yeah. as Frank said. But the assists oh, in that oh, season and many other seasons, I put him very close yeah. to more Urs Peters. I tell you, in West Ham's history, I, I oh, put yeah. him very, very, very easily. Yeah. When my first game up front for for the boys was in the Tuesday night against QPR and I'll never forget him coming to me and saying look I'll have three players on me and I thought you big headed twat and, and he says I'm just going to give you the ball just give me it back and I'll beat the three of them and I thought and it was so easy I mean it, and it, he used to get doubled up and then someone behind them and he just used to flick the ball into me I used to just lay it off and Dev would come and run and take but, it away but he didouldn't have to players, do all that Frank, wouldn't he? Yeah, yeah yeah he was great players used to double up or even it'd be like the full back marking him and the, out, the wide midfield player coming back and the central midfield player would come over as well because they were petrified and when he had it in a tight situation, sometimes he would just bang yeah. it off one yeah. touch. Yeah. And then if you were coming out of the back, or Frank was up front, Tony, or whoever, you had more time on the ball yeah. because of them being petrified of yeah. him. That's yeah. why he was, in my opinion, yeah. he was world class. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, another name there that, that brought back memories to me was Ray Stewart, you know, a you know, ferocious striker of the ball. Mm -hmm. Why was he called Tonka? Well, basically because of that, I think, yeah. is, is hard shot, wasn't it? You know, he just oh. basically.